fantastic to see you all here on a Sunday, on such a lovely day, but I think over the next 90 minutes, you'll see that it was well worth your time to be embarking with Ben Okri on a journey into the imagination. Now, I can think of very few writers in the world who I think can really embody this theme. Let me just give you a short intro to Ben. Ben Okri has published many books, including The Age of Magic, Dangerous Love, In Arcadia, Astonishing the Gods, A Time for New Dreams, and The Famished Road, which won the Booker Prize in 1991. Many of these books will be available outside after this session. Now, he has published 10 novels, three books of short stories, two collections of essays, and three volumes of poems, the latest being Wild. I've got that right here. I loved, I loved this volume of, of poetry. Unfortunately, I don't think it's available today but it should be available uh, online if you wish to purchase it. I really highly recommend this book of poetry. Now, his works have been translated into 26 languages. He's been a fellow commoner in creative arts at Trinity College, Cambridge, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. He was awarded an OBE in 2001. Now, Mr. Okri's books have won numerous international prizes, including the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Africa, the Paris Review, Aga Khan Prize for Fiction, the Chianti Rufino Antico Fattore International Literary Prize, and the Premio Granzani Cavour Prize, the recipient of many honorary doctorates. He is a vice president of the English Center of International Pen and was presented the Crystal Award by the World Economic Forum for his outstanding contribution to the arts and cross-cultural understanding. He also wrote the film script for the film N. Is that how it's pronounced? N, The Madness of Reason. He's an honorary fellow of Mansfield College, Oxford. He was born in Nigeria and brought up in London and then brought up again in Nigeria and then back to London. So uh, of man who has experienced many different cultures and worlds. Uh, and we'll be talking about those inspirations in your writing. Now, Ben Okri, you've such an accomplished writer. You've written almost you know, every genre, novels, poetry. Very few, I think, writers have been able to be successful in so many forms of writing a literature. What drives you? What inspires you? That's a very difficult question. Um, but I think, first of all, before I answer the question, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be here. It's my first time in Hong Kong. Been wanting to come for a long time. Um, it's one of those famous cities um, of reality and of the imagination. Um, it really is. Uh, there are cities that are cities of the imagination, and Hong Kong is definitely one of them. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, what inspires me? What drives me? Um, I think I, I would say that I'm inspired by people. Um, I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by life. I'm fascinated by history. Um, I'm fascinated by how things turn out. Um, when, when, when we're much younger, we, we think life is, is and should be all of a piece. We really do. We have this ideal notion of how life should be. Um, and as you live a little longer and experience, life has a curious way of surprising you. Um, and I'm fascinated by those surprises. Um, I'm fascinated by the surprises in books, the books that you loved when you were much younger. When you revisit them and rediscover them, they turn out to be not quite the books that you read. They're, they were deeper, stranger, more disturbing. Um, I'm fascinated by films, I'm fascinated by art. Um, so for me, I, I think the writer should be, I believe very strongly that the writer should be as enriched by as many things in life as possible. Um, among my friends, I, I treat it as um, uh, an act of um, respect for them to challenge me 
So in certain situations, my friends are allowed to say to me, Ben, do you think you can make a poem out of this moment? And I'd say, well, why don't we see? Could you? Um, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the audience. We'll Could you now? Yes, of course, if I have to. But only, on, only if I have to. What do you think? Would, would we, you know, would that, wouldn't that be a real treat? <laughs> oh, who said maybe a little later? That's a real diplomat. <laughs> I like that. No, but yeah, but I, th uh, yeah. Um, and if you look at my work, the body of my work, it only seems to be such a, a big body of work because um, every moment and everything interests me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised when I meet writers who are only interested in their culture, their history, and the books that they grew up with and, they, and that they love intensely. Um, I, I, I see the great value of that kind of intensity, that kind of limitation and focus, but partly because of my upbringing, because of the way life has worked out for me, um, I, I'm constantly finding inspiration in new things, new people, new possibilities, new histories. Um, I hope Hong Kong inspires at least a decent short story from me. It has already, hasn't it? Because Who said that? you are you are a fan of Kung Fu and Bruce Lee and martial arts. In some way I think that must have informed at least some of some of your work. Yes, well you're not supposed to tell them that. <laughs> that was a secret between us. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I sort of um, I think it's almost it was almost derogue for uh, my generation to be um, interested in the martial arts, and certainly in martial arts movies. In Nigeria, when I was growing up, there were two great film traditions that really affected everybody. One was the Indian or Bollywood tradition, mm. which was really, really popular. Um, and if you didn't see an Indian movie in Nigeria, uh, you just were not really living in Nigeria. Um, and the other was the martial arts. So it kind of like all territories were covered, love and fighting, you know romance and courage. Um, and I think, I think Bruce Lee exploded around the time that I was kind of like leaving school. And at, at school, I was, I was kind of like the smallest. Um, I, went to school to, I went to school very early, because i just come from England. And all my classmates were much bigger than me. And so um, I, was a, I was a ripe candidate for bullying. Um, and in the first year, I, I took the bullying. In the second year, I thought, I have to do something about this. And Bruce Lee came on the scene, <laughs> thankfully. And um, the wonderful thing about the martial arts that I still find really fascinating is the way in which it overcomes the odds. Um, so size doesn't matter. It's really about speed and thought and strategy. Um, but then the more I explored it, um, the more I became interested in the, um, the dimension of discipline. Um, you don't actually really get to be good in the martial arts till you have executed at least 10,000 punches at a punch bag. It really is about effort and time, waking up very early in the morning, running around the ghetto where you grew up, doing ridiculous number of press-ups. Does that um, ethos, does that work ethic also inform the way you write? It, do you wake up early to write? Do you, do you have a routine? Well, I was kind of building up into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, so, the, so the martial arts, you, so martial arts taught you one thing, repetition, patience, and overcoming frustration. And these are the three really great things that I think get in the way of the development of any art. Too many people are too impatient. They want to learn how to write well. They want to write well very quickly. Mm. They want the tricks and the tips right now. They want you do this, you do that, and you'll be a good writer, you'll be published, you make lots of money. Impatience. Frustration. Um, to write, I think it takes maybe about, maybe at least about five to seven years to be able to write a truly good sentence. Five to seven years? At least. Wow. And I'm talking one se good sentence. One good sentence. One good sentence. Um, so with many people, they start early, and they write many bad sentences, and some of them are published, unfortunately. Um, we won't name names. <laughs> and um, 
but it, it, it does require that time. Um, time not only in learning how to write itself, but learning from the tradition. So it's two things at the same time. It's learning how to write, learning about the tradition, let's make it three things, and then learning about life. Because to distill life into writing is also a long process. It takes a long time to actually know what you can write about. Um, we tend to think that um, it's the dramatic things in our lives that are the things that should be written about. Um, and you do that, that's why younger writers waste really good material because they think, oh, that incredible thing that happened to me, I'm going to write a novel about that. But they do that too early. And the thing is, once you've done that with a piece of material, it's very, very hard to, uh, to do it again better. So a lot of good material is ruined. I tend to say to young writers, don't go for the most dramatic things. Just learn to write about nothing. Like Seinfeld? <laughs> no, worse than that. Like nothing. How to write about nothing. 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 And then slowly learn how to write about something. You're giving me funny looks. <laughs> how, how would you define nothing and something? Um, what do you think? How would you define nothing? Is it simply not writing? No, it's writing. It's writing. Who can give me an example of nothing? Waiting for the bus. Waiting for the bus. Anybody else? Buying the milk. What? Buying the milk. Buying the milk. Buying the milk. That's a good one. Anybody else? Drinking a cup of tea. What? Sitting in an empty room. Anybody else? What? Before sleeping. This is a really creative audience. It is. Oh my God. Normally, normally I do this, I can't get one nothing. I've got about seven nothings. Anybody else? We're doing really well. I, 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 just two more and I'll, I'll let you go. Washing your hair. Anybody else? That's, that's pretty dramatic, <laughs> don't you think? I'll, I'll, I'll half a light, so just one other half. Sitting at the table. Sitting what? Sitting at the table. Sitting at a table. That's a quarter. <laughs> I, need, I need another quarter. What about what? Emotion. Give me an example of an emotion. Despair. Despair is pretty dramatic. That's, that's, that's something. Contentment. What? Contentment. Contentment. Wow, that's difficult. That's, <laughs> contentment is really difficult. Yeah, it is, it is really nothing. Can you, can you see how you can write a short story about waiting at the bus stop? Can anyone see how they can write a whole short story about waiting at the bus stop? The bus doesn't come in a story, by the way just about the waiting at the bus stop. Can you see how you can do it? Yes. Right. Can you, can you see how you can write a story about washing your hair? You don't finish it, you're just, you're just washing it. A whole short story. Can you? Who said yes at the back? <laughs> how many of you have got, have got pen and paper with you? Okay, quite a few. Okay, how about we have Two sentences f about, you choose, two sentences of a story, you choose, either about washing your hair or waiting at a bus stop. What was the other one someone said? Drinking a cup of tea. Drinking a cup of tea. It's got to be a short story, two sentences about any of the nothing things we mentioned. And I'm going to give you five minutes. Just for, I will, those, I will time that. just for those of you who've got pen and paper. For those of you who don't, construct it in your head. You can use your phone. I think five minutes is too generous. Let's make it three and a half minutes. <laughs> Juliana, are you timing them? Starting from I am. now. Okay. Yeah. Later on, we're going to discuss why we're doing this. Should we look at them while they're doing this? Yes. Or should we have our own private conversation? 
I think we should stay. Actually, oops. Okay, surely, Juliana. No? They actually have another 90 seconds. I can't believe it. You're very fast, Ben. You are professional. Juliana, you're being generous to them. Okay, they've got 15 seconds more. 15 seconds. Three and a half minutes is actually quite a long time. By the way, I've never done this before like this. <laughs> this is a first. Okay, shall we wrap up? Five, minutes, five seconds more, I should say. You've got five seconds five to put your full more. stop. Dot your I's, cross your T's. Or maybe not, leave them uncrossed. Excellent. Okay, are we done? Excellent. Now, first of all, I want to ask you, what did it feel like doing that? How did that feel like? Those of you who did it, what did it feel like? Can you speak a little louder at the back? It felt like fun. Felt like fun. Anybody else? Frustration. You're frustrated. I like that. Good. Anybody else? Feel like nothing. What? Feel like nothing. It felt like nothing. <laughs> Anybody else? Nothing to write at first and then rushing to finish at the end. Wonderful. Interesting. Anybody else? You recollected. Okay, did anybody invent, did anybody make up something that they'd never done before? Yeah? yeah. yeah. What did it feel like doing that? Why? What, what did it feel like doing that? Scary. Scary? I felt scared because um, since the Americans are trying to eat for my stupid things, <laughs> 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 three and a half minutes, I just felt like I was in their shoes and it oh. You were stressed, yeah. okay. Stress is good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that. Stress is good for creativity, it really is. Um, anybody else? You felt like you felt like a prick, a prank. God, I was worried for a minute. Jesus, I was thinking, man, I didn't. I wasn't hoping to have that effect. No, a prank. Okay, right. Anyone else? Exams. It felt like exams. Time limits. Time limits. Exams. Exactly. What do folks feel about exams? Pressure. Does anybody love exams? <laughs> Nobody loves exams. Hong Kong has a lot of exams. Oh, you have a lot of exams here. Okay, you must really hate it. Okay. Well, can I just say one thing really quickly? I thank you all very much for just joining me and taking part in this. Very, very important. 
because I wanted you to experience, I'm sure you all do, but I want you to experience what it is like, one, to write immediately, yeah? Because most people want to write, but they never get around to it. They always say, oh, there's this novel I want to write, there's this, they never get around to it. They talk about it, they dream about it, they write letters about it. For some reason, 10 years goes past and they never get around to it. Do you know why? Has anybody got any ideas why they never get around to it? No habit. No? They don't create the habit of writing. They don't create the habit. Anybody else? No Nobody's pressuring them. Anybody, any, anybody else? Um, you couldn't get a start on it. You couldn't get a start on it. It's lonely. It's lonely. Too busy. Too busy. Excellent. Not determined. Not determined. Okay. Guess what? You just did it. That's how it's done. I say to people, writing is never done in the future. Writing is not a future tense. It's a present tense. Writing is like now. It's really very difficult to get that across. But people always think that writing is a thing that I will do when I have time, when I retire. I'm too busy right now. When I'm less busy, I will do it. But actually, the curious thing about writing is its nowness. That's what I wanted you to do, to just sit down and write about a moment and see what happens. The curious thing is that actually writing makes time for itself. It's really weird. It's more, it's more weird than reading. It really is. Reading, you actually have to make time to read. Writing creates the time for itself on one condition, that you do it right now. So when friends come to me and say, oh, I've been wanting to write this short story, I'm having difficulty. I says, when did you last write? They say, well, I haven't begun it yet. And I say, have you got paper with you right now? I say, yeah. Have you got a pen with you? I say, yeah. I say, right, right now. They say, right here, right now? I say, yeah. Right now. Well, the thing is, the thing is, the thing is, um, we actually need the pressure. It's, it's unfortunate. It has to be urgent. The thing about writing, that's why I keep saying, writing is it's an urgent thing. If you don't feel the urgency of it, it's an existential thing. If you don't feel like, if I don't do it today, I, I might be dead tomorrow. So I'm going to do it today. Um, actually, to, today is, is too long. I'm going to do it now. Not in five minutes' time. So I always say to people, carry a notebook. Carry a notebook and carry a pen. Because life might just give you a beautiful pressure to write now. The second thing I wanted to get across with this writing exercise is actually, first of all, we have this fear. There's no greater fear than actually committing your mind to an empty page. No greater fear. And I double the fear because I asked you to write about nothing. nothing. Yeah? But some of you did. Most of you did. Why? Because when the mind starts to work on what appears to be nothing, it discovers actually that there is no such thing as nothing in the human experience. It is all something. Just sitting there and staring. I could write a whole short story, not quite a novel. <laughs> only, only Samuel Beckett can do that. But I could write a short story about just sitting there and just doing nothing. No thoughts in your head whatsoever. I could do 10 pages of that. Because when the mind turns itself onto what seems like this empty space, the mind is a self-generating machine for the creation of stories, moods, ideas, possibilities, language. If you give the mind the chance, it works. It generates. That's why you had the nothing at the beginning and then the panic at the end, because suddenly the mind had got into activity. Yeah? And that's why I listed those three things. Of all the three things, frustration is the most difficult for writers beginning to write, because you're struggling with, with, this, with this thing. But frustration is easy to deal with, actually. The only way to deal with frustration is actually to be frustrated. 
But it's true. People deal with frustration and they say, oh, this is frustrating, I'm going to leave this, I'm, I'm out of here. And frustration has won. But if you allow yourself to be frustrated and stay frustrated, frustration turns very slowly into creativity. Did, did you not write a poem just now? Where's, what's the difference between poetry and prose? Uh, the same application of the mind. You think poetry is more disciplined? Uh, no, I think poetry is a state of mind. It's an angle of the mind. Ben, would you like to read? Ah, Would you like okay. to read a poem? I'm being pulled back from my, <laughs> from my undisciplined on that, condition. Um, on, on that thing, would, would you like to read a poem from this um, selection? Yes, I'd love to. I've did, actually marked did, one that, I, right. that really spoke to me. I'm, I'm um, following instructions here. <laughs> Perhaps because I'm a new mother myself. And uh, this poem is on page nine. Okay. And perhaps you could re revisit that question. My mother sleeps. Okay. This is a poem I wrote um, when I was uh, much younger and my mom was alive and she came from Nigeria to come visit me in London. And I had a little bed sit, just one room, a little bed, a chair. I was very poor. And she came to visit and she was really tired and she fell asleep in the chair. And I just stood there watching her asleep. And I just thought, ah. Oh and I wrote this poem. But since then, mom has died, she's passed on. And I call it My Mother Sleeps because I want to keep that present tense condition of my mother. Yeah? My mother is sleeping on my battered armchair. It is night and I have become a child again. I remember her in my childhood years, sleeping in dark corners where the rats chew the Gary sacks in our hot little room, or on wooden chairs in the green darkness, or on cement platforms near the gutter of the unforgiving street, through the unhappy years, on, through the unhappy nights and the suffering years. The remembrance rouses in me dreams of strength and dreams of fear. I watch over her as she gently sleeps. The soft dreams flutter her eyelids. Her quiet breathing and the blessedness of kindly eyes that are shut tight and the parted lips soothe my anxious soul. She is travel weary and has found her son. How patiently she stayed awake all those years, watching over us in our heaving, worrisome sleep of childhood, watching our future become our past. Now that she sleeps in my battered armchair, I know that she dreams well. I am watching over her. My turn has come round at last. Thank you. I just love this poem, really spoke to me. Um, for you, did you, you know, this book came out two years ago, three years ago? But this experience was many years ago? Many years ago. Did you store that up in your memory or did you write it at that? point and put it together much later? I wrote it at that moment I told you about. I was just watching her sleep. I just suddenly, I suddenly realized that um, actually um, mothers watch their kids sleep. Um, it's very rare that we actually get to watch mom sleep. It's a, it was a strange, I think it was a strange moment in which I realized that I'd crossed a sort of a line in my life and that something was turning in relationship between me and mom. And I just, I just watched her sleeping. It was really, 
really strange experience. It was a nothing moment, really. You're watching someone sleep. Um, but it just pulled out of me, this, all of these emotions, all of these years, fear, courage, vulnerability. Um, and it was rough when I wrote it. Um, and then she passed away, and I was going over my papers looking for some poems, and I found it. And I found it, and it brought back that exact moment that I was watching her. Um, and I rewrote it in relationship to that exact moment um, while trying to keep the narrative there. So it was actually written at two different periods, one when she was alive and again when she was gone. So in a sense, death is part of the rewriting of that. It's part of the wistfulness, the sadness um, of it. So it's exactly what you're encouraging us all to do, isn't it? What was that? To, to watch for those moments yes. that could be perhaps considered to be nothing, yeah. but somehow move and inspire you. If you look at them deeply enough, yeah. And then write it then and then? Yeah, I think writing it then. You see, the thing is an emotion, a really strong emotion or a haunting emotion is very brief. It just happens to you, passes through you, and you're like, oh, wow. And then life happens, life, life continues, the, the bus turns up. <laughs> <laughs> or your hair is done with washing, or the tea is drunk. And then you know, the phone rings, and then the moment is gone. And you forget it. And it's lost, and that's it. Um, whereas if you wrote it at that moment, in a magical way, it contains that moment and the history of all the moments connected to it. It's a very, writing is a very, very strange thing. I always say to people, it's really good if you do one of the arts, whether it's writing, whether it's music, whether it's painting, because these are the great storers, they're the great um, private museums, they're the great embalmers, they're the great protectors of memory, feeling, hope, all these fleeting things, because life is made up of these fleeting things, passing moments. It's, it hits you and then it's gone, and then you've moved on to something else. Um, and, it, you know, so the, the capturing of that is, I think, part of the magic of living um, that we do for ourselves. Because if we don't capture them, we experience them, and they're gone. But if we capture them, we experience them, and they are enriched, they're preserved, they're kept, they are, they're alive, in a, in a way. Do you meditate? An astonishing question. Do you meditate? What an astonishing question. <laughs> You're not going to do um, a Jeremy Paxman on, on me, are you? No, no, no. I will only ask twice. <laughs> Perhaps just once. How do you define meditate? I suppose that's what struck me, because you were talking about being in the moment and seeing the moment I and being alive only in the moment. I think you discover that as a writer. I think most writers who don't meditate they discover that, and if you were to tell them that you were doing this thing in a the moment, they'll be shocked. They'll say, well, what on earth are you talking about? I'm just <laughs> making notes, I'm just, you know. But you're absolutely right, it is, it is there is a keen um, relationship between writing and meditation. I think of writing as a kind of open eye, um, active meditation, it is, because those of you who wrote, when you, you wrote your pieces, did you notice something about your minds when you were writing? Did you notice something about, what did you notice? You were there. You were there, yeah. Any, anything else? Healed. healed. Yeah. Wow, okay. That's <laughs> profound. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, Smells and sounds kept rushing on you. Anything else? It's a what? What do you mean by that? Ah, uh, okay, your mind's jumping. Okay. Yeah, you kind of got me stunned there with that. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's what happens. You, you, you go into a state. And I think a lot of writers are addicted to writing because they don't realize it, but they are actually addicted to that meditative state. It's, um, it is partly a journey into the imagination. And a journey into the imagination is an, ext is an extraordinary thing. You, you leave this realm, you leave here and now, you go into this other state that you're imagining or remembering. 
and you occupy it really intensely. It's a very intense thing. Few things are as intense as that. Uh, so, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. So, I mean, this 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 um, book of poetry to me is very, perhaps, for lack of a, uh, lack of a better word, nonfiction. You know, yeah. I, I feel you and your life very distinctively. Um, it feels that you're speaking to me, your voice, as in as you, Ben Okri. These two books, The Age of Magic, uh, which has just come out and The Famished Road. This is your, perhaps still your most famous work. I'm trying to do something about that. <laughs> uh, are both very... Not to make it less famous, but to get something else to compete with it. I'll get to that, because you, this, you, know, you, you, you won the Booker Prize very early, uh, when you were very young. Um, so these two novels are very rooted in the imagination. What in your life experience, uh, you know, pushed you to write these two works? Deep question. You kind of got me speechless for half a second. <laughs> Take your time. Oh, yeah. mm. the, fa the Famished Road. Uh, the Famished Road came about, um, <laughs> you're going to be fairly shocked by this, so Brace yourselves a little bit. The Farmish Road came about because I was trying to write another book. <laughs> As you say, life happens, right? Yeah, I was, there was another book I was trying to write. Um, and I wrote quite a bit of that book, actually. Um, and it was fine. There's nothing, not, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but that book was closer to my experience closer to my life as I'd lived it. And then I put it away and years passed and then I went back to the book. And as I started to write, rewrite that book, I suddenly th thought, this isn't, this isn't so interesting to me. This is, about, I'm just, you know, this is about my life. And I thought, you know what would be really nice? What about if I didn't write about my life? What about if I just, and I did that? So I had the safety of the other book, which was about my experience. And then when I came to rewrite it, I just uh, wandered off into this other territory. And I was wandering off for years afterwards. It was a really enjoyable, disciplined, difficult wander. So that's two things I always get across. Sometimes doing the thing that you want to do is not necessarily the best thing that you want to do. How do you know the difference? <laughs> How do you know when you found that thing that you're really meant to do? Because when you're doing it, you disappear. When you're doing it, you're not aware of it. You, you vanish. It's, it's, like, it's like falling in love, you know? You, you vanish, you just, you're in this state. Now, this novel is about a spirit child. Yeah. And his experience over a period of time. You need to tell them what a spirit child is. Can you explain what a spirit child is? <laughs> <laughs> Have you all heard of spirit children? Has anybody heard of spirit children? Apart from those who've read the book. No? Well, a, sp a spirit child, we have this tradition in Nigeria, in actually a lot of Africa. A spirit child is a child who is born into this world. Um, they turn up, they take one look at the world with all of the difficulties, the suffering, all of that stuff. They take one look at it and they say, mm-mm, <laughs> I don't want to hang out here. And then the first chance they get, they go back. They die. They can will their own deaths. Um, but in our tradition, we have a, over a long period of time, mothers have come to realize that some of these children, uh, they go away, and then they come back again. And sometimes they mark them when they die. So if the child comes back, they'll recognize that child. 
So is this tradition of children that are born, turn up, look at the world, say, uh-uh, they go back, and destiny, they, the cycle of destiny compels them to come back, and they take one look at the world, and they go, uh-uh. But sometimes their mothers say, ah, oh, I know you. <laughs> you were here the last time. Um, and the whole thing about the spirituality is how do you get children like that to stay? And that's what this book is about. It's how do you make children who don't like what we've done with the world, how do we seduce them into staying in this world? So it's a big challenge for, for, for parents. How to make life sweet, how to make life beautiful, how to make life uh, tantalizing with all of its difficulty, all of its exams, and stuff like that. Um, so we have this, it's a, for me it was a very fascinating problem. You know, what reasons do you give a child, especially a child in a ghetto in Nigeria, what reasons do you give a child to live in this difficult world? Not easy. And he does stay, he does stay he does with stay. us through, through this. Through 500 pages. And, and two other books. Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up. <laughs> yeah, it's, a trilogy, a, there's a it? it's a trilogy. It's a trilogy. You could say that's writing about nothing. It's a, a lot it? happens. Really? I won't spoil it, but you know, so much happens just in this 500 words. But how did you? How? Where did this germ? Where did the germ of this idea come from? Was it in the? Was it in that other book? Were you also writing about spirit children? No, it, it, that other book wasn't about spirit children at all. Um, at all. Um, I, I think the, the, the gem of the idea had been floating around in my mind because I grew up with a lot of spirit children. My sister is a spirit child. Um, we've got many famous writers in Nigeria who are spirit children. We call them abikus. If you're Yoruba, you say abiku. If you're Igbo, you say obanje. Um, we have quite a few of those, and people, you know, mothers know them and recognize them. Um, and I, I grew up with people saying, ah, look at that so-and-so, it's a spirit child. And they're usually very beautiful. There's something about them. There's something very um, slightly distracted, slightly very gifted, but slightly, yeah, there's something about them. They're kind of special in some way. Um, and when they say, oh, that person's a spirit, that person's a banjo, you go, wow. And it's kind of like hung around in my mind. Um, and I was going through a difficult time in my life, and um, I was actually f asking myself what reasons I had for living, actually. I was actually asking myself that, that question. And so writing the novel was, for me, um, a very intimate way of answering, answering the question. What, what, why, why am I going on? Why am I still here? Why do I get up in the morning and, and keep going? Strangely enough, I had the same conversation last night with a friend of mine who I hadn't seen for for about 25 years, we went to university together. And we got into this long conversation. We're asking, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, why are you still here? <laughs> I bet he wonders the same himself. <laughs> yeah, what, what matters to you? What, what matters in this life? What, you know, what are the, what's keeping us here? And we spent, you know, a lot of, a lot of beers and gin and tonics were lavished in answering that, 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 that question. But I find this really fascinating. Do you, do you think that um, Nigerian culture has a different view of death and, li and living? I think, I, think, I think the African culture has a, has a diff different view of, of death from many Western cultures. I'm not going to generalize. Um, but, um, and it's not all African countries that have the same African view. They're, very, they're, they're shades of differences. But on the whole, um, the African view of death is cyclical. Um, we believe that when you, when you die, you join the realm of your ancestors. Um, and then there's another part of the cycle in which you then become, as it were, you enter into the realm of the unborn, and then you enter again. It's a kind of reincarnative cycle. We wouldn't use that phrase. Um, so we, dim we demarcate the world into the world of the living, the world of the dead, and then the world of the unborn. Um, and sometimes, sometimes the, th that's why you get many names in Nigeria. Um, would be some, would, when you translate it into English, it would be, my grandmother has come back. Um, 
or oh, my great grandfather has come back. There are many names like that. These kids are born and their mothers look at them and they say, my God, that's my, that's my grandmother. <laughs> um, they recognize them by these traits. It's, a very, it's really very strange. Um, so there's this, there's this it's a, so the minute you have this view of death, that you know, um, when you die, you enter the realm of the spirits, then you enter the realm of the ancestors. The minute you have this view, death is not as terminal as it is in the West. In the West, death is a really terminal thing. And when somebody dies, that's it. All you've got is memories. Um, you have a tomb, you have a grave, you have pictures, and you have memories. That's it. There's no way of having a relationship with them once that has happened. It's, that's it. Whereas in our tradition, my father and my mother, my mom is still here. Mom is, mom is a guiding presence. She's in the realm of the ancestors. And if I'm going through difficulties, I can summon her. I can communicate with her in some way. I can say, Mom, I'm making an absolute fool of myself. What should I do? I can, I can do that. And I, partly because I remember being, um, when we left Nigeria, the very interesting thing about this is that geography doesn't affect it. So it's not that, you know, you're, you're in the village, your mother or your grandmother died in the village, therefore she is only in the village. In the Western tradition, you go to the grave and that is where the person is. If you want to honor them in any way, you go to the grave side. Um, in our tradition, it's, geography doesn't affect it. So I remember when we came to England um, and dad was making a libation at the door and it was summer and his his father and his grandfathers and his grandmothers. And I said to, when he finished, I said to Dad, Dad, but we're in England. And they, they, they died in Africa. My dad said, oh, it's, 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 there's, no, there's no country in the, in the world of spirits. There's no, there's no countries. It's the world of spirits. And they're with us. And they're with us. Mm. So you can go to Iceland and they're there. <laughs> So that was, that, was very, that, was very, that was very liberating for me, actually. It was extraordinarily liberating. It opened up. Um, because I think one of the great anxieties we have about life is death. Mm -hmm. The terminality, the finality, the unarguability of death. It's a really, it puts a tremendous pressure on how we, on how we live. And that, that sense of uh, the ancestral domain, that death actually opens out into something else, was greatly liberating for me, and I think also was what informed um, the family story. It was me dealing with death, opening up death, actually, in a, in a kind of reverse glass, hourglass sort of way. You were working on this when you were very young, in your 20s. Late 20s. Late yeah. 20s, 20, 20, 20. and during a difficult time in yeah. your life. Were you yeah. homeless at the time? No, the homelessness had just overcome it. Just overcome. Yeah. I mean, for me, it would be quite surprising, in some ways shocking, to, to hear that someone so young was thinking about something that most of us don't think about until we're much older. Or perhaps is that, is that a Western way of thinking? I don't know. I don't want to generalize again. But um, um, I, I, I was kind of aware growing up that death was a constant uh, companion to life. That, you know, um, for one thing, there was, <laughs> there was a lot of death in Nigeria. Yes. Kind of car accidents, armed robberies, illnesses, the kind of War. wars, the kind of, I mean, I grew up in the Civil War, so that was like a factory of death. Um, but just quite apart from war, it's just, you know, a relation, you see them one day, the next day they're ill with malaria, the next time you hear them, they're, you know, people are weeping over them. Um, young kids just die overnight. So I, I was const we're constantly breathing death alongside with life. So, you know, coming to England where death is so, death is kind of rare. <laughs> death, is <laughs> death, death, is, death is much rarer in England than in Africa. I think it was one of the first things that struck me about England. It was like how <laughs> it really was. It, was like, it really was. NHS. <laughs> and it, and so it's that, great. <laughs> and, so, and so actually that gave me the space to actually think about it. It was, uh, it was a very fruitful, Seeing, seeing yeah. a place where death is not so frequent. Kind of in, in Nigeria, there's a kind of a, um, a pollination of life and death at the same time. You know, someone will give birth to triplets, and at the same time, someone else's daughter's just died. It's like all of them, everything's just happening all at once. It's this, you know, 
this simultaneity of all the tragedies, the comedies, the wonderful things, the bloody awful things, all at once is happening. Which, and that had a big influence on also my style, because I had to, I had to find a, uh, it took me a long time to find a style or a tone of voice in which I could deal with all of these things calmly. The important word there is calmly. Um, because when it happens to us, it doesn't happen to us in a, you know, it doesn't happen to us like you're on a, on a, on a horse that's running away with you. It just happens. You're eating your pound of down one morning, and someone says, oh, um, so-and-so has just died. And you think, oh, really? Wow. How come? It just happens. And I wanted a tone that could touch the awful things, the wonderful things, the simple things, the nothing things, calmly. And it took me many years to find that tone. May I ask you to read the beginning? You had that look on your face. I just, I just love the way this novel begins. It's so poetic. Do you want to read it? No, I would like you to read it. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you have a very lovely voice. I thought you might want to... Okay. <laughs> In the beginning, there was a river. The river became a road and the road branched out to the whole world. And because the road was once a river, it was always hungry. The Nigerian... Why did you laugh? Did you think that was too short for a beginning? She was, wasn't she? I'll tell, Actually, you, I'll, te I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. That's, that's the first paragraph, right? That's the first paragraph. I'm going, to give you the, I'm going to give you the first chapter of The Age of Magic. Yeah? So, you think that was long. This is the first chapter of The Age of Magic. Some things only become clear much later. That's it. <laughs> you know what? I love meeting authors because when, when I read by myself, which is how, mo well, it's how we all read, isn't it, most of us, right? We, we read by ourselves. Maybe occasionally we'll read to our children, but most time we'll read by ourselves. And we'll, we will read it in our, in our voice. It's always wonderful to meet the author and have the author read in his or her own voice. How much of the tradition of oral storytelling inform your style? Because, you know, perhaps it's just the wonderful way that you read it, but it's just so poetic when you read these words aloud. And, you know, even though this is novel, this is, this is a novel and, and this is poetry, you know, they, they just sound so alive. Do you guys think so? when he reads it? I mean, how much of that is informed by a tradition of oral storytelling, which we don't have much nowadays in this modern, modern world? Okay, this is how I read the beginning of The Famished Road. In the beginning, there was a river. That's how I read it, right? In, this, in the oral storytelling tradition, this is, how I'd, this is how I'd read it. In the beginning, <laughs> ha! There was a river. <laughs> That's how you tell it. In the beginning, so the point I'm trying to make is that in the, in the oral tradition, in the oral tradition, In the beginning, there was a river. The river became a road. And the road branched out to the whole world. Hmm. <laughs> I 
I've never visited Nigeria or Africa. I mean, how is this tradition? I mean, do, do is it just your parents reading or speaking this to you, or is, it, is this all around you? Is this just the culture all around you? Well, we're, we're a great storytelling tradition. Um, I think that's passing away now because of television. That's a shame. And cinema and radio and travel and internet. Um, but when how I was is it done? How is it, how is it done? You know, is it over dinner? Is it after dinner? I, actually, you tell stories whenever an occasion for stories turns up, actually. You tell stories when, you, when you're having an argument, you disagree. And someone says, um, I say to you, Ju Juliana, what is it that matters most to you? For me? Yeah. My kids. You see, if you were back home, you would tell a story. You would say, what is it that matters most to me? Ah, let me tell you a story. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was this mother, there was this woman. Ah, for 20 years, she wanted to have children. Oh. <laughs> so we tell stories as a way of illuminating life, as a way of answering questions, as a way of not answering questions. Um, all the time? All the time. All the time. My mother told me stories because I was a bad boy. Um, and was, it, was it mainly your mother? My mother was a storyteller. My mother, she discovered this trick that, you know, um, because I was stubborn and I, I'll do the opposite of what she tells me, she decided that the, maybe the best way to get across to me was to tell me stories. So if I did something wrong, she'll tell me a story. But the story often didn't have a point. <laughs> um, or, it, or she'll start the story and she'll stop suddenly in the middle of it. And I'll be waiting for her to finish. And 30 years will go past. And I'll be thinking about this unfinished story or this story without a point. And I'll be thinking about it and thinking about it. And because I'm thinking about it over the years, I'm extracting things from it. I'm thinking, is that what mom meant? Is that, is that what mom meant? Is that what mom meant? Ah, that's what mom meant. And I'll get 20 things out of it. Whereas if she'd said, Ben, don't do that, because if you do that, you know, you upset your brother and, you know, you piss your dad off. <laughs> I'll get nothing from it, except not to do that. But with a story, I'm thinking about it 20 years later, 30 years later. I'm still thinking about it now as I'm speaking to you. And your father was not telling stories? My father was the philosopher. My father asked me questions. My father, I went to my father if I, um, to ask questions about what the meaning of life is, if, to ask questions oh. about, to argue with him about Greek philosophy. Because my reading came from his library. So I'd read his books and I'd argue with him about them. And he'd say, why are you reading Greek philosophy? You should read African philosophy. I'd say, oh, really? Where, 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 where are the African philosophers? And he'd say, oh. And I'd look, I'd look up in the air like that, and I wouldn't see them. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd say, then. So then years went past, and I was in England, starving, learning how to write. And the stories I wrote that led to the famished road, one day I was writing something, and I suddenly understood what my father's gesture meant when he said, what he meant was that the philosophies of Africa are everywhere. They're in the air. They're, you just have to breathe them, translate them there. They're everywhere. It's a different perception of philosophy. So philosophy is something you extract from, from, what, the, from, from what the world tells you. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a very, it's, it's an idea that books are already implied in the universe. It's a reverse of the, the universe I implied in books, which is what you have in the Greek tradition. It's a very different idea of books. Is that what you've done? That's what I'm trying to do. Because I'm still doing. Still doing it. I'm still pulling books. I mean, this, uh, this trilogy is set in Africa, unnamed country. Africa and... The, unnamed country. And... And the world. And, and this one, Switzerland? Set in Switzerland, Sw yeah. Set in Switzerland, yeah, but yeah. how did you get from Africa to Switzerland? Well, remember... O what, over the years, over the, yeah. You remember what my father said about, you know, geography doesn't exist for spirits. 
Well, geography doesn't exist for the imagination either. The first book, actually, how odd, the very first book that I wrote, the very first novel that I wrote, was set in China. It's odd, I've just suddenly remembered that. Um, I'd never, of course, I'd never been to China. And I think, it's the, I think it's the quality of the imagination that when you start to write, you want to write about somewhere as far away from where you are as possible. And I can imagine kids in China, their first books are set in Africa. And it's true. We tend to do that. And what happened with that, with that book? It, it didn't go very well. <laughs> I didn't know enough about China. <laughs> well, now you're here. Now you're here. Can I ask you to read another poem in this, in this volume? OK. I, I do what I'm told. I love this one. OK. Shall I read that one? Can you read this in the oral storytelling tradition? Oh, my god. <laughs> I, just, I just love it. <laughs> this, is, this is difficult in the oral storytelling tradition. Is it? It's difficult. OK. Should I just read this normally? Well, you want some oral storytelling in it? You want some oral? I think there's agreement oh here. Oh, my God. There's okay. a consensus. Okay, I'll try. I've never done this before. I'll try. I'll give you half oral. How about that? Yeah. This is called a New Year poem, Oh, That Abstract Garden. And I wrote it um, at the beginning of the year. Um, I've often wanted to write a poem about about the year coming. I've never, we all have these New Year resolutions. I thought I'd write a New Year poem. And this is, this is it. Oh, that abstract garden of being tells me to be brave and clear in the fire of living and in the journey through the year. So I will grow me like an oak tree, and make life's honey like a bee. Each day I will walk an interesting mile, and with the sun I'll share a smile. I will play again like a child, and celebrate what's wild. I will swim in every sea or river, and reflect the light of the sublime giver. I will be at ease with opposition. And I will cultivate intuition. I will walk the surprising streets and dance to life's unexpected beats. I will notice all the phases of the moon and try to act not too late or too soon. I will write something new every day and look at paintings in an alternative way. I'll not dream the same way twice, but I'll not be shy to repeat what's nice. I'll have the courage when needed to change, and I won't forget that life is strange. So I'll learn to love the simple things as well as the complexity that life brings. Good or bad, I'll learn to treat the same and I'll not forget it's all a mysterious game. I'll not let that general fear of death ruin my life and I'll make magic even out of strife. Into the higher realms I will enter and make my corner the center. Oh, that abstract garden, make me clear. Make me brave without fear. I'll, I intend to love this rich new year. Thank you. Thank you. But we don't have much more time with Ben. Ben, before I open up questions to the audience, would you like to read for us what you wrote during that three and a half minute exercise? No, they haven't read theirs. Why should I read mine? Would you like to go first and then no, we can no, ask no. it? No, no, no. Let's get theirs first. All right. Yeah. 
Let's get two. Any volunteers? Yeah. One or two people. Who wrote about nothing? Anyone brave Come on, to share? Let's, let's have a brave person. Or, or, or a not so brave person. Okay. You did yours on the telephone, didn't you? Good. Let's have yours. I'm obsessed with my hair. So this is my sentence. <laughs> and, you, and you drink tea, right? No, I didn't, I'm, I'm not English. So. Ah, right. <laughs> it's more like dim sum for me, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's have it. Okay. So my sentence has 18 characters, I mean 18 words. She missed the bus again, for she insisted on stop. washing her hair. Stop, stop, stop. I like that first sentence. I, it came to me yeah. like within seconds. That's a good sentence. She missed the bus again. Very difficult, but very easy. Please, carry on. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> From for the she, beginning. Okay. For she insisted on washing her hair before she left home. That's my That's sentence. That's good. You combined the two, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you made your, love, your, your job very easy. I want to hear the third sentence now. Anybody else want to take a risk? Share something with us? Yes, please. Please. Microphone the lady in the pink, please. Yeah. yeah. Just, just think of poor okay. me up here. Yeah, I'd hate to be up there. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was too early, but I hate rushing. Time to think about what had just happened and what was to come. That for, let, let's, have the, let's hear the first bit again of that sentence. I knew I was too early, but I hate rushing. Okay, say it again slower. Take your time over it. I knew I was too early, but I hate rushing. Isn't that a lovely first sentence? Uh, yeah. <laughs> if she says so herself. <laughs> Anybody else? So it wasn't so difficult. Yes. Anyone second, else? Second row, lady in the pink. Yeah. I think we're having all women being brave here today. I'm kind yes, of. Yes, we, we normally yeah. are the braver sex. <laughs> the water has lead in it. Will it affect my brain? Will I die faster? Wow. Wow. This is Hong Kong, because Hong Kong just had a. Uh, this scandal. Ongoing, ongoing lead yeah. scandal. Ah, that's a dramatic. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. Anybody else want to take a little shot at this? Please, thank you. You're, doing it, you're standing up for the men here. <laughs> Good. Prove Juliana wrong. Um, th that uh, background of uh, um, um, uh, nothingness was um, drinking a cup of coffee as suggested by. Um, uh, member of the audience. Okay. So here it goes. The cup stops midway as if it is a frozen frame and she stares into the empty space two inches above the coffee as if the void has acquired a life of its own. That's a very literary sentence. Mm, very. That's a very literary sentence, very yeah. impressive sentence. Oh, we have a very um, impressive audience. A very impressive, very audience. impressive audience. You could almost all of those beginnings. You could start stories with that already. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And you? Oh, I was hoping you forget that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we to, haven't forgotten. I was trying to. Okay. Why don't you read it? Can you read my handwriting? Can you are, you, are you actually a doctor, Ben? <laughs> yeah, go on, give it a shot. It was a... Leary? V very? <laughs> Is my handwriting that bad? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Really? It was a very morning. No, that doesn't make early, sense. Early, early. No. Give me that. <laughs> Is it really that bad? That's lazy. Lazy. Right. <laughs> God, really? Okay. It was a lazy morning, semicolon. Outside the window, the light on the towers were dim. That's it. There's more. Yeah, I know there's more. <laughs> so shy all of a sudden, but please don't be shy. Uh, do you have any questions for Ben Oakry? Yes, please. I'm quite surprised that you are the screenplay, but do you still actually write on paper, or do you...? I, I handwrite. Um, I don't, I don't... Say again? 
I, I find it, I find it, I think, clearer writing by hand. Um, I, I almost have a magical belief in the relationship between the brain and it's, it just seems to me to be perfectly logical that, you know, the thought goes straight through the hand. It's, when I want to think clearly, when I want to think, my, if I have a you know, difficult problem, I, it's, you know, thinking with, with the hand seems to me to be the most intimate and the most inside way to do it. Now, I'm not saying that you can't write, because I went through a period where I, where I typed, but everything I typed, I had to, I had to, it had to pass through my hand before I, it had complete authority for me. If I didn't handwrite something, it didn't have the stamp of my inward occupation of it. It's, it's, everything is done by hand. I carry, this is, I like, I like completely non-ostentatious notebooks. A very simple thing like that. I like, I like it that it opens like that. I like informal, I like it informal. I don't like anything fancy. I don't like fancy paper. I don't use a fancy pen. Um, Cause I, 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 I don't think the fanciness should be in the instrument really. I don't think the beauty of it should be in the instrument. I think the beauty should be in what comes out of you. And the simpler it is, the less self-conscious you are, for me. I know, so I've got some friends who write with, you know, $2,000 pens. And, and they write well. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to knock them. But they can't write unless they have their expensive pens. Whereas I can write with any old pen. Um, really. It's not the pen that's important. Do you write with your hat on? <laughs> Juliana, if you don't mind my saying so, that is the weirdest question anybody <laughs> has ever asked me. That is like the weirdest question. I'm do you, creative. Do you, do you want to give yourself a chance to sort of redeem that question? Are there things that you need, you know, do you need to write with a cup of tea with you? Do you need to have a certain setup? Okay, uh, Juliana, yes, I write with my hat on, yes. <laughs> Jesus. I need a headline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can write without it on. I mean, it's... <laughs> you don't look at me with such concern. Um, earlier on, I said how um, it takes a long time to process your experience. It really does. It's very, very strange. You think that because you've gone through a lot of stuff. I, I grew up during the Civil War. I nearly lost my mother in it. I lost relations. You would think that, you know, you went through this. And you should be able to write about this, uh, you know, in your early 20s. It just takes a long time to process it. I'm still, um, yeah, I still write about Nigeria, um, but at the same time, I, you know, I've been in, I've been in England for a while, um, and it took me a long time to write about that. Um, so, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in time, actually. I really, I really, I'm, I'm a, I have a, I have a time thing. Um, sometimes I can compel myself to write about this very moment here, right now. But even when I do that, I still like to have a time relationship because I think writing, writing by its very nature is reflective. By its very nature is about perspective. Uh, and sometimes when something is right in front of you, um, you need to be far away in order to see it. It's really weird. Um, so, yeah, I, I write about Nigeria, but I also write about, this is the age of magic is set in Switzerland, you know, um, there's a book called The Astonishing the Gods, which is set purely in the realm of the imagination, um, and so on. So I don't really mind. Um, I don't think the writer should be concerned what they write about, so long as it comes from their belly. It comes from the fire inside them. It comes from a sense of urgency, a sense of hunger. I think it's got to be, you've got to feel the hunger in it. 
You've got to feel the passion, the mental, spiritual passion. And is that in the future The future will do what the future will do. Like I said earlier, you may, pl you may plan, but life has other ideas. I've, I've had many plans that have, you know, life has just... So we'll see. Thank you. He's asking, to, asking me to elucidate what imagination is, and he asked if I was more skillful at it than other people. I don't think so. I think imagination, let's, let me stress this, I think imagination is a profoundly human faculty. Um, I think it's impossible to be human without imagination. It's just not possible. It's, language would not be possible without imagination. Language itself is already an act of imagination. Just the fact that we will replace a thing called tree with leaves outside with the letter T-R-E-E -E in the English language or the character that they use in Chinese. Just the fact that we can have one thing stand for another that's not there is already a huge act of imagination. The fact that we tell one another stories. You know, I said to you, hey, James, <laughs> let me tell you what happened to me the other day. For me, it's memory, but for the person I'm telling it to, when they hear it, for them, it's an act of imagination. Because you're saying, you're saying, oh, I went to this pub and I saw this guy with you know, three eyes. God. And this person's listening is going, really? And they, for a moment, they see it in their minds. They really do. They may say, no, I don't believe you. But they, they say, I don't believe you, when they've already kind of slightly imagined it. Um, so it's, a fa it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most powerful uh, one of the most civilizing, one of the most forward-driving faculties that we have. And if you ask me what imagination is, I would say it's the capacity to make images in the mind. One of the most fundamental and incredible faculties that we've been given. And I think it actually makes a big difference between uh, people who are forward-thrusting, forward-going, and people who are not. Because people who can see images in the mind means that there are people who can imagine things differently from how they are. And I think civilization has been driven forward by people who can say, really, this, this little hut that I'm living in, can't I live in somewhere bigger than this? And then for a moment they shut their eyes and they can see somewhere bigger. And they say, ah, oh, I can see it. And because they can see it in their heads, they can set about trying to make it. They will fail many times. But after a while, they'll figure out how to do it. And then they'll do it. It'll be bigger. And then the other person who's got a tiny little house will say, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> and he says, well, you know, I, I saw it in my head. I saw that I could do it. Now, that's how civilization, that's how our lives get driven forward. Some of us use that faculty more than others. Some of us believe in the power of that faculty more than others. You know, when they want to put someone down, they say, oh, you're a dreamer, you just dream things. Actually, <laughs> excuse me, it's the dreamers that we depend on, you know? Some people can dream and others can turn those dreams into reality, but if you don't have people who can dream, we're finished. We're going to be stuck on one level forever, you know? The first, the first pyramids that were built in, in Egypt, the step pyramid in, um, in, Sa in Saqqara, I've been there, I saw it. The step pyramid is an astonishing act of the imagination. It's a failed idea of a pyramid. It was a preparation for the idea of a pyramid. It proceeded by steps, literally. That's why you see, you see the steps by which it got there. And the boy, when they came to perfect the idea of the pyramid, someone looked at the step pyramid and said, those steps, what if we make those steps smooth? Wow. From one great idea, just one, another step added to that great idea, and something astonishing is born. And so journey to the imagination. Imagination is a big word for me. It's imagination makes the world. Um, Napoleon said the imagination is, is greater than the, the canon. I'm 
paraphrasing. He was terrified of the imagination. Virgil said about the people, huh, he asked in, in the Aeneid, they were about to go to war with another people, and they were a bit afraid of them. And someone asked them, do you think they can beat us? And the person said, this is from Virgil, I wish I could give you the original Latin, but it's gone now. And he said, they can because they think they can. This is Virgil. That's imagination. Ten people think they can take on a hundred people because they can figure out in their heads how to do it. They can see it. So it's not just about writing. People think fiction is like um, a poor relation to reality. No. Fiction is the superior graduation of reality. It's the transfiguration of reality. It's extraordinary. It's stories on the page here, but in, in the minds of living people, it is, it, is the, it is a birth of possibilities. It's the change of, 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 of our lives. It's saying, really? Do our people have to be sick all the time? What about if we, what about if we had a, a system of health service where everybody, everybody has a right to, to be treated? And the health service is born. Act of the imagination. Act of compassion, yes, but act of the imagination. We depend on it completely. So not that I'm better at it, we're all good at it, it's just, some of us make the mistake of thinking that the world is more real and more fixed than it actually is. The minute we think that the world is fixed, you can't do anything to it. You said the world is, is exactly as it is, we can't change it. But imagination says, no, the world is not exactly as it is. The world is also how we make it. Sorry about that, folks. I guess. <laughs> We are actually out of time, but one more question before, y yes. Are you, are you conscious of... No, I was just looking at him for... I was just taking him in for a minute. <laughs> Spirit child? Spirit child? I was just no. taking him in for a minute, because he's the one who wrote that. Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think, there are, I think there may be three parallel processes going on. Um, there's, there's the initial impulse to, say, write a poem, which is, for want of a better word, it's a cloud... It's a cloud it's like, um, that's me, that's my beard, right. Interesting. Oh, I, did, I didn't know my beard had a sound, sorry, sorry. So that you have this thing at the back of your head or in your head, it's like uh, unformed, um, it's a feeling, it's a throb, it's a mm -hmm. And then you start to write the poem and it's on the page, it's beginning to happen on the page. Parallel, at the same time, is something inside you which is constantly anticipating all the thousand possible routes that the poem can take with each word that turns up. It's very strange. So it's like a, a, a high-level, incredibly supercomputer going on inside you, formless. So you start the poem, The River Rose This Morning From My Dreams. Someone should write that down. It might be a good line for a poem later on. <laughs> yeah? The river rose this morning from my dreams. Automatically, at the same time, inside you is going river, rose, dreams, what thousand different roads it can take, yeah? For the next line and the line after that before. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? So there, is a, uh, there are many processes going on apart from what just happens on the page. And the poem is as alive as we are aware of all of those processes and possibilities, yeah? So it is, so, so poetry is an act of uh, uh, super awareness of the speed at which the spirit works in language. This is just the first draft I'm talking about. 
Well, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. Ben Okri, thank you so much. That was an incredibly imaginative 90 minutes. I think I speak to the entire audience when I say I was very inspired and I hope to be inspired in my daily work as a journalist. Uh, I would also like to thank the British Council and the Hong Kong Book Fair for bringing you here and making all this happen.